After the death of King Solomon and the division of his kingdom, the Bible then speaks of Israel and Judah as two separate nations. Most people today are utterly unfamiliar with this critical history, even though clearly explained in the pages of your Bible. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Trumpet Daily. Earlier this year, while in the Middle East, we had the chance to record a program at the Tel Don Nature Reserve in northern Israel. It's a beautiful park featuring trails winding through lush greenery and numerous footbridges spanning dozens of streams that seem to flow in every direction. The network of streams empties into the gushing Dan River, the largest and most important source of water for the Jordan River. Nestled in the midst of the sprawling vegetation are the excavated ruins of the ancient Israelite city of Dan, the most important city in the northern part of the ancient kingdom of Israel, according to some historians. For the main message today, we recount the often misunderstood history about King Jeroboam and the division of ancient Israel. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Trumpet Daily. I'm speaking to you today from Tel Don, the Tel Don archaeological site in northern Israel. Right here is where the biblical city of Dan was located anciently. Dan, of course, was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. This city, situated on a mound, is located at the base of Mount Hermon. The Dan River emerges at the foot of the mound and is one of the sources that feeds the Jordan River. This, and the fact that it was a stop on the trade route between Galilee and Damascus, made Dan the most important city of the northern part of the Kingdom of Israel, according to one historian. The Bible tells us that this city was originally known as Laish, before the tribe of Dan, known for naming places after the name of their father, migrated north and renamed the city. Thus, the city of Dan became one of the first examples of many self-named places left behind by the migrating tribe of Dan, prophesied to leave a serpent's trail behind them. You can see more about that in Genesis 49 and verse 17. Here at this archaeological site, you can see the world's oldest known gated archway, constructed more than 1,500 years before the Romans supposedly invented the arch. There's also the city gate complex and a long section of, of the wall of the old city. The inner gate is the best preserved and is a good example of an Israelite city or of an Israelite city gate during biblical times, according to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The cultic precinct, or the high place of Dan, still exists and is believed to be the site of King Jeroboam's temple and Jeroboam's famous golden calf, or I guess you could say infamous golden calf. This temple precinct, by the way, is located just behind me. You can see, uh, I think the first uh, version of it was built by the original Jeroboam, or the one that came along right after Solomon. Uh, and then Jeroboam II came on a couple centuries later and remodeled and refurbished it. But this is the location of where Jeroboam came and established this pagan form of worship Let's turn over to 1 Kings 11 and see some of this important history, Israel's history, and as it relates to this very site, the city of Dan. In 1 Kings 11 and verse 30, it says, And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take you ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. So the garment here symbolized the kingdom of Israel. Ten pieces, or tribes, were to be given to Jeroboam. His ten-tribed kingdom would be headquartered in Samaria, north of Jerusalem. Notice now the next chapter. This is 1 Kings 12 and verse 1. 
it says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass, when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, it says, just as a thought here or an aside, uh, he fled to Egypt, as the scripture indicates there, because uh, Solomon was trying to kill him. So he was seeking refuge in Egypt until Solomon died, and then he made his entrance back into the land of Judea. Verse 3, it says, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spoke unto Rehoboam, saying, so they assembled together and they came before Rehoboam to issue their formal complaint. This would have happened, uh, no doubt, soon after the death of Solomon. Now look at verse 4. It says, Your father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make you the grievous service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve you. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again unto me, and the people departed. So the division of the nation, well, to just give you a little bit of background, Rehoboam went and, and convened a, a meeting with his advisors, and then, as you probably know from the biblical narrative, he came back and said, well, we're not going to ease up at all. In fact, we're going to add to your misery. We're going to increase the taxes. And this led to the division of the kingdom of Israel. So the division of the nation centered on this oppressive taxation and the leadership of Rehoboam. But more important than that, all of the squabbling between the tribes, is the fact that this division of this kingdom was all prophesied because of Israel's many sins, particularly Solomon's. God told him, I'll divide the kingdom or, or rend the kingdom in two. This was his way of punishing, punishing Solomon for his many sins. Verse 20, it says, And it came to pass, when all Israel, we're skipping down a little bit, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, it points out, and hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So as you see there from that history, Benjamin joined together with Judah, and as we'll see in a moment, the tribe of Levi ended up going along with Judah soon thereafter. We'll see that, as I said, in just a second. So Judah, for the most part, had three tribes, and then the nation of Israel, as it became known as, had ten tribes, if you count Joseph, as two separate tribes, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. That's how you come up with 13 total. The 10 tribes of Israel, which later became known as the Lost Tribes of Israel, and then you had the three, three tribes that came together as the little nation of Judah. Now notice, just going back to what we, we, we just read there, that the division, or this division, between the tribes nearly resulted in a full-scale civil war, but God sent word and stopped the tribes of Benjamin and Judah from going out to fight with their brothers in Israel. Now let's skip down to verse 26 in this same chapter. Verse 26 says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Notice what happens here. He was fearful, now that the kingdom had divided, that the people would return to God, and he didn't want them to go back to Jerusalem. I mean, to this point, all of the religious observances had centered around the activity in Jerusalem. And Jeroboam feared that if the people observed God's commandments, if they observed God's commanded festivals, he feared that they'd return to Jerusalem from season to season, and then eventually switch their allegiance back to the kingdom of Judah. And so Jeroboam had a solution, he thought. He didn't look to God's law or to God's way to establish a new nation, to solidify his rule. 
He thought, in fact, that obeying God's commands would ruin the kingdom. That's what he thought, that if in breaking away, Israel continued to obey God, that it would somehow lead to his demise. And so notice what he did immediately. It says in verse 28, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. He says this to the people, that is. Behold your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and he set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. Dan, this very city that we're standing in, Jeroboam made two golden calves, golden calves of all things, and he placed one of them right here in this city. And notice he reasoned, as we just read there, he reasoned to these people, well, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's too hard to make the journey and to travel to go to services or to observe God's holy days. He seduced the people, the people of Israel, by promising them the easy way, by promising them the smooth way. It's just like so many preachers do today who promise their adherents that you can't, you can't possibly keep the law, but all you've got to do is just accept Jesus and then you'll be fine. See, it's all so easy. It's all so quick. You can't possibly try or strive to obey God's commandments. You can't be expected to keep God's holy days. You can't be expected to observe the Sabbath. There's a much, much easier way. It's much, much more convenient to do it this way. That's the way the carnal mind reasons. That's the way man's been reasoning for thousands of years. Not just in Jeroboam's day, but today as well. Verse 30, it says, and this, this thing became a sin. I mean, that's an understatement, if ever there was one. It says, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. So people from all over Israel now came to this very location to worship at this altar behind me, to worship at this temple precinct, to worship before this golden calf. It says, and he made an house of high places. Here is this high place. We're at it right now and made priests of the lowest of the people which were not of the sons of Levi." So he just immediately wiped out the Levitical priesthood and he opened up the kingdom to anyone being able to serve in the priesthood. Anyone could be a priest. Anyone could be a minister. It no longer had to be of the tribe of Levi. And the reason he did this was not to make it fair and balanced, to not open it up to anyone in a democratic kind of way. The reason he allowed the lowly to become the priest was because he wanted to control them. He wanted to control the people of Israel using religion, which again is not that unusual when you look at the history of human civilization, to use religious uh, beliefs or to use religion as a means to exercise control over the masses. He wanted influence. He wanted to maintain control. He wanted to guide the people. And so he raised up this pagan form of worship with this new priesthood and controlled the people of Israel. This is like so many rulers today, as I say, who just want to use religion to control the masses. And as a result of this, going back to the history in Jeroboam's day, as a result of this, this radical transformation, most, if not all, of the tribe of Levi then joined together with Judah. They left Jeroboam and then went off and joined Benjamin, as I pointed out a minute ago, and then, of course, Judah. And those three, primarily, became what was known as the kingdom of Judah. And then the ten became known as the kingdom of Israel. The two separated. Verse 32, it says, And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month of the fifteenth day of the month. Now, on God's holy day calendar, the feast was to be observed in the seventh month. And so he just moved it a month back. Uh, it says, Like unto the feast that is in Judah. So it was very similar to what Judah was doing, but it was at a completely different time. It was a month later, it says, And he offered upon the altar, uh, and, did, and so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel 
the priests of the high places which he had made. So he established, as I said, these temple precincts. He's the one who established the priesthood and everything revolved around this pagan form of worship, which no doubt had bits and pieces of what the Israelites must have been familiar with, or in other words, uh, religious uh, themes, ideas, images that they were familiar with mixed in together with all of this pagan idolatry, like the golden calf, which everyone should have recognized given Israel's history and what they struggled with even in the wilderness in the days of Moses. Uh, mixed together though, here was this poisonous mixture. And again, just notice how similar this history is or what happened here in, in Dan to the way human nature works today. Jeroboam took a religious sounding festival and made it into something that he thought would work better, that he thought would be more convenient, that was at a completely different time. Uh, but see, even if you go back to some of the very same names and some of the very same practices, if you do it according to your ways and not according to the way God establishes, establishes it, then it's all just rank paganism. It's not God's religion. You certainly can't just make it God's festival because you call it such. You can't change it and then claim that it's God's. God's the one who establishes it. God's the one who sets the times. God's the one who arranges the seasons. I mean, he's the creator, he's the maker. He's the one that established his sacred calendar. You can't just go and change days on a whim and say, well, this day is easier. Most everyone does it, so let's go with this day. We've got to go back to the Bible and look at what God says with respect to these observances with respect to true religion. What is true religion? Where does it come from? Where does it originate? In the mind of some king or some culture? Or does it come from God? It must come from God. It has to come from God. Now, if you go back far enough into Israel's history, really the, the thing that's most remarkable about all of this is that Jeroboam came on the scene, as we covered at the start of the program, right after Solomon died, you had King David, Okay, and then you had, I mean, the peak or the apex of the kingdom uh, during Solomon's reign. Solomon had his problems, obviously, but the kingdom was united. It was, was flowing in wealth, prosperity. And then right after he died, the, the kingdom splits in two. Jeroboam comes on the scene and changes the holy days. And, and no doubt at this point, changes the Sabbath observance. Not long after the death of Solomon, changes the Sabbath observance and then Israel's off and running and soon after would lose their identity after they went into captivity because they got rid of everything that made them unique and distinct in this world. They lost that identifying sign and this is something that Mr. Armstrong, uh, by the way, Herbert W. Armstrong explains in his booklet on the Sabbath why the northern kingdom became the lost tribes of Israel. That's what Jesus called them in Matthew 6. They became lost from worldview because they lost their identifying sign. You can study that in the book of Exodus, I think chapter 31, where it talks about Sabbath observance being an identifying sign for God's people. They got rid of that sign and then lo and behold, they became lost from worldview. Judah to this day is still recognizable. That's not to say they've faithfully adhered to all of God's laws and commands, but they have held on to the Sabbath, in, at least in some form or fashion. And so people know where the kingdom of Judah is today. People can identify the Jews, and they're mistakenly called Israel, because that's what this little nation here was named 50-some uh, years ago, 60-some years ago, I guess now. But they're really the kingdom of Judah. They're descendants of that southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. Then the northern tribes, of course, were taken into captivity later, and uh, and then lost their identity. So you can see, really, when you go back to this history with Jeroboam, that's not to say Rehoboam did everything right, but you can see why Israel was the first of the two kingdoms to go into captivity. Now the sad part of it is, Judah, of course, didn't learn from her sister's rebellious acts. She didn't learn the lesson from what happened in the northern tribes. Instead, she followed right into captivity about 120 years later but she was able to retain some semblance of her original form, at least in the proper name, because, again, there was a retention of that Sabbath command. You continue to observe that, and you do stand out.
You will, if you, as Mr. Armstrong said in his booklet, if you start observing it, the Sabbath, you'll see how that you stand out right away, right away. It's a pity, again, that Judah didn't look at what happened in the northern tribes and say, wow, we better learn these lessons and not make the same mistakes that our brothers have made. Now just think about, just think about how different this world would be had Israel held on to the Sabbath days, had Israel observed God's commands during the days of Jeroboam, and had they continued to through the, through the kings of Israel. Notice verse 33, it says, So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, and you would assume that this also occurred in Dan, judging by what we read a minute ago. It says, uh, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, here goes these, these pagan observances at different times, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. You see, it was something that he devised. It came from him. But as I said a little earlier, this is not something that God gives man the prerogative to do. This is God's prerogative to decide when and where and how we observe his laws. One more verse in Judges 18. Judges chapter 18. This history really reminds us of why we always have to turn to God and the Bible to understand what God expects when it comes to religion, when it comes to our religious practices. Judges 18 here, verse 30, it says, And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. So what happened after these generations of disobedience? Well, the tribe of Dan, along with the other northern tribes, went into captivity first ahead of Judah. According to Archaeology of the Land of the Bible, Volume 2, the city of Dan flourished, it says, until the late Iron Age, when Galilee and the northern coastal regions became the first areas to be conquered by the Assyrians. The Assyrians, under Tiglath-Pileser, destroyed Dan, and a new city was later constructed over it. Assyrian pottery vessels and statues, in addition to Phoenician chapels and Persian period settlements, have also been uncovered in Tel Don. The name Baal also appears in a few of the finds from Dan. So, and you could add to this that the most famous discovery found at this very site turned up in 1993 when a team of archaeologists uncovered a 9th century BC stone tablet bearing a clear reference to the house of David and the king of Israel. And the author of the inscription, it was written by an, in, an invading army, the author of that inscription boasts of having defeated both the king of Israel and the king of Judah, the latter monarch being a descendant of the house of David. Now it's interesting, we've referred to this quote before just to show how that King David did establish a monarchy in Israel and then later it was just in Judah after the tribes split and this is something that a lot of historians and archaeologists like to deny or at the very least minimize like it was just some tribal chieftain ruling on a hill somewhere but in fact it was a kingdom. Even Israel Finkelstein and one of his colleagues uh, two notable skeptics when it comes to archaeological discoveries that confirm the biblical record. Even they couldn't ignore the significance of the Tel Don tablet. They wrote in 2001, thus the house of David was known throughout the region. This clearly validates the biblical description of a figure named David becoming the founder of the dynasty of the Judahite kings in Jerusalem. And it certainly does validate the biblical description of the founder of the Davidic dynasty. But think about it, and think about it in relation to this history that we've covered here today. Doesn't it also validate the many warnings that were delivered by Israel's prophets, which said over and over again that if the people of Israel did not repent and turn back to God and to God's laws and to God's festivals, that they would eventually be overrun by their enemies and then carted off into captivity. 
That's what the prophets came and told Israel over and again. Now you can start and read the rest. We don't have time to finish uh, the first part of chapter 13 in this passage that we've studied here today. But there was a prophet that was sent to warn Jeroboam, as you can read there, and Jeroboam didn't heed it. I mean, here you would think, if anything, I mean, this prophet pronounced a curse on Jeroboam and had to have the, he had to have the prophet pray to God just to reverse the curse. And you would think this would have been a life-altering experience for this sinful king. But it didn't change Jeroboam. It didn't change the people of Israel. They continued on ignoring these many warnings that came to them by these prophets, like the unnamed prophet here in chapter 13, but also the other ones that are quite prominently featured in the Bible and named and that have been really uh, institutionalized in the true church as God-fearing men who put everything on the line to warn God's people of where they had veered off course. But the lessons, the lessons are clear in history. The lessons really are clear in these stones behind me in that while it's great to excavate a place like this and see something that points back to the kingdom of David, that points back to David's dynasty. I mean, that's fascinating history, and it verifies the authenticity of the Bible. We can't, we can't though, forget the lesson of all these stones, which is that when we turn from God, it never ends the way we want for it to end. We've got to turn back to God. That's why the prophets kept telling Israel and then Judah later, turn, turn you. Why will you die, Israel? Why die when you don't have to? When you can just turn back to God in humble obedience and keep His laws and commands and then receive the blessings that He promises to come along with it. This is Stephen Flurry reporting to you from the archaeological site of Tel Don in northern Israel. As you learned on the program today, as soon as Jeroboam gained control of the northern kingdom, he rejected God's holy days and introduced idol worship into the nation. This continued over many generations. Through it all, God sent numerous prophets to plead with Israel to warn them to return back to God. But Israel refused. So God uprooted them out of their own land and scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. You can find that in 1 Kings 14 and verse 15. Much of this history is explained in this reprint. Just call our operators today and ask for the ruins of Tel Don. It examines that critical period of history when Israel was taken captive into Assyria. The often overlooked significance of this history is thoroughly explained in Herbert W. Armstrong's book, the United States and Britain in Prophecy. This book tells the story of what happened to the northern tribes of Israel, also known as the Lost Ten Tribes. Where did these so-called lost tribes go? People of the Western world would be stunned, dumbfounded, if they knew. You can know if you delve into this book, like millions of others have. We offer it free of charge, at no cost, or obligation to you. Just call the number on your screen and ask for the United States and Britain in Prophecy, as well as this free reprint, The Ruins of Tel Don. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you again tomorrow morning.